Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Leo Meyer and my co-host Dolly Curtis with a new edition of Backstage Buzz. But tonight we have a special treat for our audience. We have a gentleman who is one of the most multi-talented, uh, a total, a total whiz at what he does. Not only a great author, a musician, a composer, a pianist, an actor, a director, a producer. He has done it all for many years now, and he is currently uh, doing our great Tchaikovsky, which is his one-man show that is coming into Hartford stage uh, as, as we speak. And I, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Hershey Felder. Hershey, good evening. Hi, good evening, and thank you for having me on the air. Well, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have somebody as gifted as you, because you, oh, wow. your credits are amazing. Your background is extraordinary, and and a gentleman of great taste in what you're in what you're doing. Well, that's that's very kind. Thank you very much. It isn't every day that uh, you, we get, we have materials such as such as this on the boards. Most most of the stuff is so so terrible and and. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when it comes to music these days, you, you, it's it's wonderful to have this um, this this kind of a program. So, uh, tell Thank us, you. tell us, uh, what 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 does the audience expect uh, to see? What, what what will they see when they come to the theater? Is there, the piano is on the stage, and and you are trembling in the wings. Well, I don't tremble much anymore. I just think a lot, and I work uh, very hard and seriously, so I don't tremble much in the wings. But uh, in this case, the piano is always central because um, it's uh, the music of Tchaikovsky as rendered on the piano, and uh, it's a play, though. So a play like this is set in a dacha in in, in Klin, which is Tchaikovsky's um, home in the late 1800s. So the piano is part of that setting. And... The setting is actually based on the very real setting. In fact, some of the things that you see on the stage are uh, period antiques from, in fact, Russia and environs. And um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to bring the audience into a period drama that also relates to today because it plays back and forth between a narration that happens today and an 1890, 1893 period where we get to experience Tchaikovsky uh, in the last years of his life, um, and also understand what he lived through and the, the inspiration for much of the music that we know and love. And it's um, a really wonderful thing to experience it with the audience together each time this is performed. And I still marvel on a regular basis at how masterful and how brilliant the music and the compositions are. And they, you know, they stood the whistle of the test of time, but for a very obvious reason, once you hear them, they're really great works of art. And so I'm very pleased and very proud to be able to present music like this in an environment that's uh, so theatrical and at the same time be able to present it at a concert level. Well, the thing is, and it's so much of Tchaikovsky's music, uh, we, we never hear. We, 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 we in this country... One of the things about, one of the things about this, this piece is that I very carefully selected the music, some of which has to be familiar, of course, because you couldn't possibly do a piece about Tchaikovsky and never hear the first piano concerto or the... Nutcracker absolutely, or, absolutely. Or, but... or the 1812 Overture. You need to hear these things. But one of the other things about being able to create a piece like this is also to do pieces and to perform pieces that are actually not quite well known. And um, and, and his so output... I have the opportunity to do that as well, which makes which makes it a musical opportunity for both me and the audience that is a little bit different. Yeah, his output was so much greater than than what we hear in this country today and and, uh, and what's uh, on recordings of the ballets and the the, the, the one opera, Eugene on Yegin, uh, and all, the, uh, but the breadth of his, well, I mean, he his was, work you know, he was... was the, the great uh, thing about, he was a great opera composer, and so we know of Genyo Yegin, which is, um, you know, there are a bunch of others. There are seven other operas. There's, you know, there's the six symphonies. 
Um, you know, we're, we're familiar with themes here and there. But to hear things complete and to hear them whole, which you don't always hear in this piece, there are certain things that are played complete, um, but, you know, of course you can't do the entire Sixth Symphony, it would take 40 minutes. So uh, <laughs> what I hope with pieces like this is that it inspires audience members to then go back and listen to the pieces, now understanding the context um, in which they were composed. And I think that makes a difference. And certainly audience members tell me that it means something to understand the context of the composition of these great works of art. Well, he had an interesting personality and was plagued with depression for so, so much of his life. But the Well, you know, I mean, it's more, he's more than just interesting in that, you know, he lived in very um, complicated times. Mm -hmm. He was a homosexual man who uh, had to be afraid of being found out for who he was much like in Russia today. And so there's a currency to the story that is uh, quite moving. And um, I find it interesting to play this story in this way, especially in our day and age, which is, is getting more and more complicated by the day. Right, and, but the music is so romantic and, 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 and uh, sw sweeping, s sweeping melodies, which we don't even hear today from other other. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, it is romantic, of course. Uh, of course, he would have called himself a classicist, but you know, um, the romance of the music is, is as many um, critics said of him, he wears his heart on his sleeve. But if you really look deeply into the music, it's constructed in such a way where it's so thoughtful and so deep in its, in its construction and its intention that yes, the melodies are sweeping and we enjoy that and the harmonies are delicious and there's so much romance, as you say, in it. However, if you know the backstory of some of it, it takes on an entirely different color, and one hears more a little bit of the pain than, than the just sweeping sort of romance or end of the world, you know, joy or whatever it is. And I think that's what's important in a piece like this, to understand where this actually comes from and why it sounds the way it does. What are the influences that make it so? And, you know, he was a, a Russian who was, um, both considered uh, far too European to be Russian, and from the Europeans, they considered him far too Russian to be European. Hmm. So he sort of lived in that, you know, uh, in between world of, of not knowing exactly who he was, except he became, and this is interesting, and I do know this from various sources, he is the most played composer in the professional concert hall now in the world. Really? Um, which is remarkable, you know, so good for him. <laughs> All those ambiguities in his life, though, you know, the time he lived in. Oh, well, I'm not sure it's ambiguous. I think, uh, I think he was very clear about who he was, and he left us the information in the writing in his own hand. The problem is, is that when the laws in Russia don't allow him to live freely then, and in fact would be the same today, um, I think one has to be forced into pretending that he was something that he wasn't, which is really a terrible thing for anybody. Supposedly, he was pretty well adjusted to it, uh, according to some of the biographers. Well, I, I think that's, that's a 20th century sort of acceptance of who he was. Well, adjusted, what does adjusted mean? You know, I can't live my life freely, but, um, but uh, this is, so yeah, I got accepted. And, and he, he was, was married. married. And, he, and didn't he have a daughter that he loved? or He didn't have any daughters. He had no, no children. No, no, no. Oh, there was no children. There was a, a failed, miserable, crazy marriage that went on for two and a half months, um, which was absolutely, you know, made him suicidal. Mm. And, uh, and he never was able to get divorced because she would give him a divorce, so that was with him for the rest of his life. And the wife was constantly threatening him to, uh, that if he doesn't send her money, that she's going to tell the whole world that he was homosexual and this would cause him trouble. Oh. It was that kind of thing. He had a relationship with um, a woman who he only saw twice and never said a word to her, and that relationship was a, a correspondence, and she supported him financially. Uh, that is the von Mick. And then, um, you know, in terms of his relationship with women, I mean, you know, uh, his mother died when he was very young, and that imprinted upon him very powerfully, but, uh, you know, he was a homosexual, where it, it was, uh, you know, uh, how do you call it, whispered about, and as long as you didn't get caught or they chose not to make an example of you, you were safe or fine, but 
you know, I don't think that he was entirely safe, and I don't think he was entirely well adjusted about it. And there was also the problem that um, the people that he seemed to fall for were, um, to say it as uh, best as one can, were a little young. And so it, it became a very serious problem. And I mean, these are not things I'm making up, you know, for the sake of drama. They actually exist in his own hands that he left us. And it's quite devastating to read how much he did suffer over this. Now, when you're doing this performance uh, this week, will you be using projections, film clips, or any historic information that's going to be uh, visually shown, or will it all yes. be? Yes, uh, we, there are a lot of settings that that are enhanced by visual uh, visual creations. Some are emotionally uh, driven, so they're you know paintings and so on and so forth. Some are actors. Sometimes we go to St. Petersburg. Sometimes we go to Moscow. We go to the world-famous concert halls uh, in Russia. So, yeah, there are all kinds of visual uh, aids that support. But the important thing in, in uh, the director Trevor's Hay approach is that uh, it doesn't overwhelm the story that we're telling. Well, he's had such a broad career and, and conducting, conducting all over the world and conducting even in New York City at the opening of Carnegie Hall. Yes, he opened Carnegie Hall. Really? Uh, oh, wonderful. You know, 1891, or what, I think it was 1891 or 1892. And um, quite remarkable because he got invited by uh, Andrew Carnegie to come and do this. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. What is most interesting about that, you know, although it's interesting in and of itself, but what is most interesting about it is he was, you know, America was still more liberated than, than Russia was, and why didn't he? And I think because his heart, Russia was really home for him. And it's interesting that he had this opportunity, but more so, it is in fact known, and he said so himself, that he was much more beloved musically in America than he was in Russia. In fact, in America, people went nuts everywhere uh, for, his, for his music. Um, and the notices in the papers here, for which we have evidence, of course, were um, over the top, you know, astounding. And he said really that good, or Americans just always prone to exaggerate, um, <laughs> which is very sweet, and it indicates a, a sort of a sweetness that he had. But it isn't true, in fact, that uh, America absolutely adored Tchaikovsky throughout his entire tour. He even went to Niagara Falls. Um, <laughs> that was remarkable. Um, and, uh, you know, he was a personality who, who made an impression in those days. He was a very gentle Russian soul, in terms of his comportment and his behavior. So the whole thing um, of having in America is very special. And of course, the first concert of Carnegie Hall featured things like the Coronation March, the first piano concerto, the 1812 Overture, I mean, things that have become American signatures. Did he uh, play the concerto? Orchestra. Did, did, he, did he play the concerto? At, uh, at no, that? I think Adele Auster O did, uh, a, a woman played it, uh, which is remarkable because it's such a big, noisy, brash concerto. And I love that women were playing it even back then, that it wasn't a uh, sort of a 20th century thing that women took it on. No, it was right back then. Um, he conducted it, though. And apparently he had, uh, well, I don't know if he conducted that, but I do know he conducted the Coronation March. Um, he conducted several things, and I think maybe the 1812 also. Um, but he, uh, he, he had a very funny conducting style. With a musician, you know, he's sort of hard to read with his baton hand except musicians loved him so much that they uh, made do with whatever cues he gave them and they figured it out. He really was a beloved figure in those days. Well, the world loved, loved his music, which was European style, quite frankly. He was not like the other composers in Russia at that time, Rimsky-Korsakov or Glinka or, uh, or Mussorgsky. Well, you know, the, the group of five there, the Maguche Yakuchka, the Mighty Handful, as they called them. Oh, right. They really believed that there was this um, Russian music that they had to create. There's Mussorgsky and, and Balakirev and uh, rimsky Karsakov. Well, if you listen to those guys, they pretty much sound European as well, to a degree. But there's sort of a Russian tinge to the music. Um, although Tchaikovsky had the elegance of of, you know, he was able to, well, it's because he was a real musician and he didn't believe in this pure Russian music. He believed in music as a whole 
And whichever way was going to accomplish his means, be it a traditional European orchestra, I mean, you can hear the influence of, of the symphonic influence of the composers that were just around him or just before him. You can definitely hear the influence of Beethoven, certainly in the use of the orchestra in terms of power. You can hear the beauty of melody in some of in drawing upon, even in Mozartian techniques, how he would bring out a melody and what he would do to do it. Um, but there was always, everything that he did is very Tchaikovsky. Even if you listen today, it's clearly Tchaikovsky. It just uses a blend of many techniques in order to accomplish what he felt he had to accomplish. And it's so rich and, 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 and remarkably melodic. Uh, yes. <laughs> It's, it's, it's wonderful. I, I just wish more more Tchaikovsky would be programmed. As you say, even well, even I, think, being, I do think people program it a lot. But you know, in fairness, nowadays it's very hard to program music for ticket buyers and so on. I, conductors want new music to appear in different music, and I think that that's perfectly fair. And of course, you have to give your standard music. You know, well, listen, if we want Tchaikovsky every July Fourth, we got it. Right, <laughs> there it is. And every <laughs> Christmas, and the uh, the ballet from St. Petersburg comes here to Connecticut, and they always either do Swan Lake, or they mm -hmm. do one of the three. Sleeping Beauty. Sleeping or, Beauty. Or, or Nutcracker. Or, or Nutcracker, yeah. And they come um, once a year, and it's always packed, fill the full house. And that's how people know Tchaikovsky. What would the ballet companies do without a nutcracker? <laughs> <laughs> Leo's done well, because it's, it's so many. It's glorious music, and it's so beautifully written, and you want to hear it again and again and again. True. I mean, he was that kind of composer, and as I said earlier, he was, is the most beloved composer, the most performed composer in the world. So it's not that it's contrary to what you're saying, but the truth is, is that he is programmed, and programmed a great deal, um, and, and, and quite beloved, although he wasn't always. The Nutcracker only came into fashion much, 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 much later. You know, in its, in its day, it was quite derided, and it was, you know, uh, considered over the top and, and not fit for the ballet. And it, oh, oh, right, there were ooh. musical snobs, critics, snobby critics that, that uh, downplayed the, the music, but the public adored it. And they still critics do. They're always mm. complicated, you know. And, you know, I, I personally, I like critics because, you know, who wants to take up a fight with them? But like everybody, not everybody knows everything, you know, and critics are not always right. And that's OK, too. Artists are not always right. Crit artists are more right than critics because they they have a different kind of vision. They see they see future things. And it doesn't mean that critics are all bad or so one should wipe a critic with, you know, one paintbrush that's negative. The truth of the matter is some see, some don't see, just like some artists are good and some artists are not. Um, but criticism, especially in the arts, is very complicated because, in general, a critic is looking for something familiar and, you know, and something that can be um, analyzed within the context of what we know. And general artists are looking for anything we don't know. So it's a very complicated balance in trying to figure out the whole thing. But no... Critics were not polite to Tchaikovsky at all. Uh, they were actually very, very, very mean to him. And, uh, you know, he had a very thick skin and, and figured out how to get through those things. And, and, I mean, there were a lot of things that were said about him that were very terrible. But uh, he got through it and uh, kept on going for money on tour yet again because the critics were so mean. Um, but eventually his music very much so came into fashion all over the world, and now, of course, he's Russia's hero. And so are you the critic's hero. I mean, with, with um, building the repertoire that you've built over, over the years... I thought we should amazing. mention some of the other... Hershey, yes, so mention you, some of the other productions that you've done. Well, the first one was creating the character of George Gershwin that nobody had done on the stage. After that was Chopin, then was Beethoven, then Leonard Bernstein, um, then... Uh, Le Franz Liszt, then Irving Berlin and Tchaikovsky, and then, then the Irving Berlin and Leonard Bernstein are now heading to London's West End, where I open them back to back, so in, in repertory, uh, at the, uh, the other palace in the West End. And, um, you know, so these things have been ongoing now for 22 years, just about. Wonderful. Uh, I wish I could and, see them all. <laughs> you, you know, but it's, it's a, a lot of fun to be able to create these characters and have an audience follow for years 
to see the various productions and so on and so forth. And I have people who, when I first introduced George Gershwin 22 years ago, uh, some mother was telling me I brought my 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 11 year old to come and see you just studying music law well now he's 30 years old and he's in a symphony orchestra and it had a lot to do with that performance that he saw you do and i think that's really wonderful to be able to live long enough to see the fruits of your labor well that leo knows all about well, speaking of the fu- of the future what 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 lies ahead for you uh Hershey, because you've been doing you've done it all so far <laughs> it's I don't know about all, but I've certainly done a, a considerable amount. I just keep working, you know. And thank God that people want to come back, because if they wouldn't, it would be really not so much fun. So um, I'm going to do one last musical character, and that will be Debussy. So we will go to France and Paris, uh, and Impressionism. It will be a study of Impressionism for our last trip, well, our last magical trip. Your and musical then, um, background must be extraordinary. Many, uh, various compositions that I'm getting back to work on, uh, working on an opera. And also uh, directing, directing several um, new plays. Uh, one for Nathan Gunn, the famous baritone. We opened that this year. A play that I wrote for him, a true story uh, of his of his life, which is quite wonderful. And then um, later on in the season, I have another one, a story of a, of a very famous cellist. So that's going up. And then uh, we have the projects that just continue. It's sort of a never-ending. A little bit like a hamster, you know, running on a wheel, you just keep on, and then the composing and whatever else comes along, you know. Well, everything that comes near to us in the metropolitan area, Leo and I are going to pay attention, try to get there, because I'd like to see as much of these as possible. So, are some of them on videotape, and are they, you know, online? Are people find them? No, we have we have filmed the one I the one I made the movie of was the one you you discussed earlier, Pianist of Wolves and Lane, Mona Golovic's piece, which I wrote and directed for her, and uh, we released a movie of that. That is available, but the others we have all filmed and they're in the can, okay. but we're not releasing them until the cycle is complete. So after the WC, we'll release everything. They have been recorded, and some of them have been broadcast worldwide on the radio. Those have been released. Um, the WFMT radio network out of Chicago did do Bernstein, they did Gershwin, they did Chopin. I don't think we aired Beethoven, but all of them have been, have been recorded, um, and some have been released, these worldwide recordings that we did, uh, uh, worldwide broadcasts that we did, um, have been recorded, and those have been, in fact, released on CD and can be found online. But uh, we have yet to do the Berlin, we have yet to do Tchaikovsky, we have yet to do, um, uh, I think, the Beethoven. How, uh, uh, do you play most of these performances yourself? Or, or? Oh, I'm the only one who does them. It's kind of a crazy technique to speak and act and talk and do all at once. That's so yes, yes, I'm, that's I'm, very I'm difficult. Myself, um, because we've, we've actually tried over the years to train others to do it, and it doesn't seem to work. It's it's one of those things that's just crafted for the things that I do, and and if somebody else tries it, it kind of doesn't look quite right. And so, what I encourage to do people to do when they come to me wanting to do these kinds of things, I encourage them to find a story that would work for them and a technique that would work for them. And some of them, I help them through in finding their own story and technique and way to tell it. Right. Right. Well, we're really excited, Leo and I, because we're going to be in Hartford in a few days to see you do this and hear it. And you'll be coming. Uh, you'll be coming on Tuesday night. Yes. Do you think you might be there? I don't know if you would be present. Um, do, do you find yourself uh, present just for opening night, or you just really once you send? Oh, you're oh, there no, doing I, it, right? I, so we will I, see. I, I think they did the opening this past Saturday. They so did. Tuesday is. The next set of performances. I mean, I you know, I'm I'm around. I mean, I go to work. I do my thing. That's it. <laughs> you know. Well, we certainly will say hello if we can find you, and we look forward to it. We we just thought the world of that performance at the Westport Playhouse of the pianist at uh, Lillston Lane. Lillston Lane, yes, yeah. yeah, it was a very special piece, and she does a lovely job with it. And it was nice constructing that piece. And I, there, I was able to construct the piece in the style with which I, I perform, although I had to do different things for her because she's a particular kind of storyteller. So, um, you know, uh, and it worked, and, and it's lovely that it worked, and I'm so glad that she has had the opportunity to perform this all over the world at this point. And she's fortunate to have you to create it for her. 
Believe well, that's, me. That's very kind. Thank you very much. It's very you, are, you are a rare and unusual t- an extraordinary talent. And it, very it, sweet, it's you. been a, a joy speaking with you tonight. And unfortunately, we're coming down the, the home stretch and uh, our time is running out. But Hershey Felder, please come back and speak with us again. Hey, Thank you very much, Dolly. Thank you, Leo, and I look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Good night. Bye.